it's 2009 and uh, we're making a film about our early life or lives. This garden is something we've made ourselves over the last 20 years while we've been here. It's rather one wonderful to have had this opportunity to uh, create a garden. I inherited the large house at the end of this garden in 1975 from my aunt when she died and I decided that it would be good if we divided the, heart, the garden in half so I put a fence halfway down the garden so that whoever lived in this news house would have a really nice garden. We um, converted this, it was in two flats when I moved up here and uh, I converted it into a family home Peter was working at the hospital at the time, so I was more or less in charge of this conversion with the help of an architect. Okay, Liz, will we uh, take our coffee indoors? Good idea. Liz, would you like some more coffee? Yes, please. While you talk about your early life. Yes, good idea, thanks. Well, my, f my mother uh, was 13 and at St Christopher's Quaker boarding school in Letchworth when my father saw her on the tennis court. Now, he was nine years older and he absolutely fell for her. Uh, well, but her parents weren't too keen on this match because of course he was an artist and uh, her stepfather was an accountant and I could, he could see the problems ahead. So they promptly sent my mother at 17 to uh, Germany in to school and while she was there she had a little bit of a hard time because of course the uh, they were gearing up for the war and she was being told to salute to the uh, do the Nazi salute which she wanted not to do but in the end she did I think keep she said I'll do it but I'll keep to my principles this photo with my mother in a stunning hat my father with his younger brother, Hugh. The people who knew my father best when, as a young man were his younger brothers, Hugh and Roderick. When we went to Letchworth, he had his studio, which father had built at the end of the, end of the garden, and he started, he imported huge pieces of elm. And really, I, he, he, he did very, I think, very imaginative, very brave things. He started carving these damn great but, I mean, things as big across as that, with an adze and an axe and then working down to get... Until his first piece went into the academy, didn't I? I can't remember which was it, the... It might have been the Earl King, which was a man riding a horse with a, with a dead Dying. child on his arm, yeah. The things you can see, I mean, he's, he's, he's got a huge panel up in Colchester Library, and he's got a very good panel up in the... Uh, in the Mercury Theatre in, in Colchester. And the, and the one thing that was always sure about Connor is that they would be beautifully made. He was a, he was a really first-class craftsman. And I'm yes. talking now, you know, I'm an older man. I'm not swayed by the fact he's my brother. He was a, a, a very fine craftsman, no doubt about that. This is all before they went to America. My father's carving a, um, the head of Beethoven. He did big work in those days. And this one, the Earl King. This is what my parents looked like when they were very, when they were young. Rather glamorous photos taken off them, I think professionally, they must be professional. Connor and Alec in this photo, sitting with their mother who's holding Hugh. There was a big gap between their age, in their ages because uh, their father was being imprisoned in the war for being a conscientious objector and Janet, his wife, uh, had two, the two younger children after he was allowed out in between being caught again and put back in. Then this photo is Cecil and Janet when they first met, early on. And then this one is of Cecil with Roderick and Hugh, little boys. I imagine after his wife Janet had died unexpectedly early. On my mother's side, um, her mother 
Tinney was married to Tom and uh, Tom was called up. She had twins. My mother was Joan and her sister Gwen, unidentical twins. I think that Gwen was mostly brought up by Nani, the, her Tinney's mother. Here they are with Nani and her and two cousins. We have Tinney and Tom, who came back from war briefly, and the child squawking on his lap is my mother, and the other one is Gwen. They had as different personalities as you could ever find. Gwen was placid and sweet-natured, and my mother was young and rebellious. Here they are in the twins in the pram, and in school days, there they are. Here's Tom in his uniform. He was killed when he was very young, and uh, that's his grave. Tinny met Frank about five years later, and uh, after Tom had died, and uh, they met on a tennis court, and they got married and had a son who is Reg, and Reg worked in the Friends Ambulance Unit when he grew up. Here they are, my grandparents, Tinny, Frank, sitting with Cecil, my father's father, in the garden at Richardson Walk. My mother's uh, mother, Nani, uh, was married also to Tom. They ran a little nursery garden, vegetable garden. In this photo we have all these generations. On the right is Nani, Tinny, my auntie Gwen, my mother's sister, her daughter Margaret, and Margaret's little son Michael. And there's my grandparents when they, as they were when they were older and I knew them better then because I, by that time I was uh, living nearby. I was born on November the 13th, a Friday, uh, 1936, and uh, I was born in Edgbaston. My parents had a house in Gough Road, Birmingham, which they must have rented. They then moved to Henley and Arden when I was still quite young. In fact, these baby photos of me, I'm, I think I'm six months old here, There's my father carving the head. My mother with me. She wrote in one of her letters that she'd wanted to be a writer. After I was born, she decided that it meant more to her to have children and rather than a career. I love this early photo of her holding me. There I am, looking a lot like my younger son Clement. And here I am with my grandmother, Tinny, who I miss terribly because at the age of three and a half, my parents decided to immigrate to America. My father felt that uh, it was very important for artists to create their work, that they were doing something not only for themselves, but in a sense, something to for humani uh, humanity. And he felt that the his reasons for going to America were, it was almost taken out of his hands. He, he writes in his letters and it sounds as if, he, it's as if he feels he's ordained to go, as if he hadn't got uh, much say over the matter because it was all sort of, he felt he was just going into something that was set up almost. As it happened, because his mother had left him a legacy, he was able to use that to, to finance their trip and keep them going in the early days in America while he looked for a job. One of the last carvings my father did before leaving for America was this one called, a big stone carving called The Long Journey. The war had broken out and finally they got passage from Liverpool on the Britannia in 19, early 1940, February 1940. The uh, 
liner was sent across with passengers with a, in a convoy. But when the convoy left them, they put a trawler in front of the boat. Unfortunately, a mine hit it and blew it out of the water. So we're jolly lucky to have survived all that. My mother, unfortunately, in this journey was flat on her back, sick the whole time. She was pregnant with my sister, so she was very worried about what nutrition this baby was going to be getting. I, on the other hand, was put in charge. A nurse was taking care of me. I spent all my time, I'm told, in the nursery on a rocking horse. And at one point, I was the only person in the dining room of this boat going across. When they landed in New York, there were queues and queues of people, passengers getting off. And we then landed up in a hotel, the Taft Hotel in New York City, uh, briefly. And uh, in fact, my earliest memory is of building with uh, alphabet bricks on sitting up in bed, playing with these alphabet bricks. And uh, my mother was very impressed with the central heating and the glamour of this Taft Hotel. Uh, the uh, when we after New York, my parents, while we stayed there uh, in the hotel, they looked around to find another place to live and bought, found a house. Sorry, bought not didn't buy, but went to a house in Piermont, upstate New York, about twenty miles from New York, on the Hudson River, and uh, they had a wonderful ha a house there, beautiful house that they were renting, and in the garden. Uh, uh, was a studio for my father. It was built on a very steep bank going down to the river. They were very happy making a home there with the furniture they'd bought in auctions and my mother was a real homemaker. My sister was born in June of that year. Here are some photos of me with my parents. And here in this photo I'm holding her. I've always been very fond of babies ever since I was little. And here she is smiling. She's, she was a very smiley baby and easy. My mother was thrilled with her. And this one is a photo of my mother that my father drew and sent back. This He sent to England the drawing of, of Joan to her parents. But when my sister was born, she was born at home and the scissors were missing. So they were looking around desperately to find the scissors to cut the umbilical cord and apparently I'd hidden them. In a letter to uh, Roderick, uh, my father wrote, partly because I've fallen in love with the country and the people, and partly because it would be very difficult to live and work here as an alien, I have decided to take out my first papers for American citizenship straight away. This may surprise you, but it wouldn't if you were here. My parents moved from Piermont, uh, upstate New York, to Putney in Vermont, where my father had a job, uh, got a, his first job in a, a, a teaching art in a school that was run on very progressive lines. Uh, and uh, my brother was born there in September 1941. And this house where he was born is called the Experiment in International Living. We rented a flat on the top floor that's the front view and the back view. Here's my mother with my brother. So he was born about 15 months after my sister. I was a rather serious child and my sister always laughing, smiling, looking happy. Now the, while we were there, so we saw horses car uh, cutting, carrying along a cart and cutting ice, which was then put in, sold to people to put in their ice boxes, because Vermont, of course, had very heavy winters. We also, my parents saw maple being tapped from trees. These photos of the house itself were taken by 
me with my brother, who is actually Christy, who is standing outside in the photo, in 1982 when I went back to the States and took, revisited the places which were important to us. Um, here's my father with my sister and I walking down the road to see the snow and me playing with my sister. Down the road from the experiment was another clapperboard or clapboard house where we met a family called the Plowdens. Uh, Stanley Plowden and Mary Plowden lived there and they became firm friends of my parents and uh, were involved in our life quite a lot over the years. They had an apartment in New York and we were friendly with their children, Joni and David. David later became a photographer and photographed all over America. Um, his passion was trains and his steam trains. He was taking photos of things that were going to be lost forever. Um, my father taught me in, to swim to do the dog paddle holding onto a trunk that was floating in this pool that was near the Plowden's house. So that's my, my five-year-old self. In one of my mother's letters to her mother, she mentions about uh, the first rationing. She says, this is 15th of May, 1942, first ration books for sugar. We got five pounds for five of us. We have to give an empty toothpaste tube if we want a new one. Only can buy one pound of tea at a time. Petrol to be rationed soon. And the draft for Connor postponed now because he's got children. In uh, 1942, we, when I was six, we moved to New Orleans. Daddy uh, started a job at Newcomb Art uh, School, which was part of Tulane University. And we were there for two years. Uh, in many ways, probably the worst two years of our life. We found a nice bungalow very nice bungalow. Daddy built us a pool and a sand pit. There was a banana tree in the corner of the garden and he made a swing, that two poles that came out from a, the tree, a tree trunk that we could swing backwards and forwards on. So that was really a lovely house. Uh, my brother, the ex sort of, he was very young but very adventurous and he would Climb. He climbed out of his cot one day. My mother and father woke up and said to me, well, where's Christy? Or did I? I think I went into their bedroom and said, Christy's not in his cot, because we were drafted in in the mornings to go and play near him to keep so my parents could sleep in a bit. And Chris, Christy was simply missing. And then when we looked outside, his nappies were in the drive. Mummy and Daddy called the police. They came round. Uh, Christy was about two years old, couldn't quite speak at that age. And uh, the police said to my parents, have you got any enemies? And they said they hadn't. and the, the, They were really very worried and he was gone for a long time, ages. And the police said, well, leave it with us. Later in the day, the phone went and they said, we've got your little boy. And apparently a nurse going to work early in the morning saw this child wandering naked down the street with two empty milk bottles, must have picked him up and put him in the middle of the park. Anyway, looking at the photos now, these are mostly are photos taken by my Uncle Michael. Now, my Uncle Michael was Gwen, Mummy's sister, Gwen, who was in England. It was her husband, Michael, who in the forces was sent to America. And he visited us in New Orleans and he was a photographer and he took these photos. You see my mother and father and my father sitting on his own. Another one of my mother. There's my uncle Michael and I'm sitting between his, I'm sitting in front of him. There's another photo similar to that, just of our family. And here's my brother in a swing in the park that I mentioned where we found the cicadas. 
and there he is. He loved this cat that was didn't belong to us. In this photo, the cat is on the doorstep and it's a neighbor's cat and he loved that cat. Here's my sister, it's so hot. You can see, you can almost see the heat radiating off her. I'm very fond of this photo because I adored my father and here we are together. And uh, this is another photo my uncle took of me holding a flower. Then there are photos of us at the zoo. My mother made our clothes and you can see how proud she was of us. She left us, you know, she kept us really looking very neat and tidy. And then there's my sister making some, uh, playing with clay. and some photos of me also playing with clay. We had these plaits, I'm sure they were fashionable at the time. Uh, I can remember the feeling of having my hair scraped back and not liking it very much. And my father showed some sculpture in that house. Um, he had a little show and one of the pieces he did was this one of the lament. My father went bankrupt um, at the end. He lost his job at the university. Uh, I, I read in the letters that he didn't see eye to eye at all with the person who was running it. Their ideas about sculpture were totally different and he could no longer really stay there. Um, but he writes to his brother, we sit insecurely on the edge of nowhere, our feet dangle an unpleasant sensation prolonged indefinitely. Fear of death, like fear of change, but change is necessary from one foot to the other to progress. Anyway, we went bankrupt. I remember my father went ahead of us to New York to try and find us somewhere to live and a job. My mother packed up the house. We traveled up to New York and it was free, going to be freezing cold up there. So my mother bought us red tights and we sat on the train. We all had to be separate because there weren't many seats. Um, no, we couldn't sit together. And she was trying to cover up the chicken pox that we had so that people wouldn't know. And we landed in New, we landed in New York, went to Philadelphia where we stayed with a family that were students originally of my father. I think it was her parent, the girl's parents we were staying with. They put us up for two or three weeks. Uh, it was my first experience of snow, really heavy snow. And uh, Daddy found a job working as a janitor in a building where he had to stoke the boiler. And one night I heard my mother scream and my father had been blown back by the boiler had blown open and he had, the blast had thrown him across the room. His beard was singed and, and my mother had to take him, took him and put him in a cold bath of water and splashed him all over with the cold water. After that we found a wonderful house to flat to live in where I have very happy memories uh, in uh, East 94th Street. We had a flat at the top of a brownstone building, number 177. And from the age of eight to 12 or so, we, were, we lived in that house. We had the top flat. There were five of us and there were two big rooms, a hall in between, a small kitchen, a small bathroom and a small box room. And here's the street. Most of my important childhood took place in that, ho in that house or in that flat. This is the school I went to later when I was 14. Dalton School. Four very happy years there. This first, the first school I went to when I was eight was called um, Alexander Robertson 
and it was a Presbyterian church, little Presbyterian church school. There were only, uh, I think, six children in my class. Very small. Later on, my mother taught there, and she also taught actually at, at Dalton later on too. We had these. Mummy had these photos taken of the th of the three of us in one of the big shops, you know, Bloomingdale's or something like that. I seem to remember. So there I am, age eight. My sister's uh, f seven. My brother must be five, six, six and five, perhaps. Of those two, eight I was. And then we met. That's right. My father worked at first in a framing shop because he, you know, to get us to get us some money after we'd been bankrupt. And there he met Philip uh, Verity. And Philip Verity had an English wife, Margaret. From this time on, that family uh, became like substitute relatives. Because of course, all our relatives were in England. And uh, it, it was, we grew up knowing them well, sharing holidays. My mother was Margaret's best friend, vice versa. And uh, in this photo, it's Sally, the younger child's fourth birthday. There's on the right is my brother, then my sister, then two a neighbor's ch two neighbor's children's here, and my and Julia and her her sister Sally, and I'm si holding a baby. In this one, I'm entertaining the children. I used to do that a lot. I used to tell stories or play little shows, as we called them, with teddy bears. I don't know who the photographer was of this one. This is taking place in Margaret's flat at the same birthday party. Now we come to 1946, I think, or 47, was it? The Great Snow. We had such terrible snow in New York. I mean, we always had a bit of snow, but this was something else where the roads were blocked by snow covering the cars. There's one of them. This shows our the stairs to our house and these the blocked up road. The cars couldn't move. As we were on a slope, they stopped cars going down at, at Lexington Avenue, down to Third Avenue and we were able to go out with our sleds and really enjoyed that. At the bottom of the road, the Third Avenue tramway, you can see it here, or el rather, Third Avenue elevated train. Now here we have a photo where we're a bit older. Uh, my mother, my brother, my sister and I sitting on a rock in Central Park. Here's another one of my father with the three of us sitting on that same rock. And there's my father. These photos were all taken around the same time, I believe. And then when I left um, Alexander Robertson School, this is my graduation picture. On the right is Miss Como, George, who I rather fancied, myself, age 11, Peter, who I didn't like at all, uh, Pauline, the minister's daughter, who I also didn't like, and Fred. don't remember much about Fred, except I think he used to crack jokes. When I was 17, and uh, uh, my father, and I took these photos of my mother and father, in, again in Central Park. The years in New York were interesting. Uh, important years and yet I don't have all that many photos because we tended to take photos only when we were on holiday. Uh, we did have long holidays. Daddy taught in Cooper's Union um, and the YMHA. Uh, he did evening classes and then in the daytime was able to do his own carving. Um, he rented an empty uh, shop to do his carving in, in quite near to our house. And uh, now we have some of his work that he did during that period, just roughly. 
he, he used did t a terracotta one of a painter. This one of the man behind bars called Everyman. Beauty and the Beast. One of three figures that he did in soap carved in soapstone of musicians. And here are two other carvings that he did. Exodus, I think this one was called. Two views of the same little group. He did that between 1945 and then had another go at it in 1960. Summer of 1947, the most adventurous I, a time of my childhood, as I remember, I was 10. My mother um, was going back to England for the first time since the war. Uh, the war had only just ended, so it wasn't at that point very easy to get transport. Um, but through Stanley and Mary Plowden, we managed to get passage on a coal carrying ship from that set off from Virginia. But we came to England and I had this vision of what my grandmother would be like because in my books in America, we had had, I thought she'll be dressed in black, she'll be sitting in a rocking chair. You know, I had this really Dickensian view of what grandmother would be like. And this young woman with a flowery dress on met us at the station. <laughs> it was really had to readjust my thoughts very quickly. Um, then uh, the first time we went to her cat house, which was uh, in uh, Oxford, in uh, near Seven, uh, Seven Oaks, at Otford, she drew the curtains. My cousins were there, so we met them for the first time. My auntie Gwen's three girls, Margaret, Sheila and Frances. And here we are sitting around having tea, unheard of for me, high tea, not used to it. This photo is of the five of us, stand taken by my Uncle Michael. There's me, Margaret, Sheila, my sister, Frances, and my brother at the end of the line. We used to go to Noel Park, say that Noel Park went there several times with my mother and grandmother and I remember the uh, catching butterflies on the South Downs which were just at the end of her road. That was lovely, really lovely. I can remember the smell of thyme. That's my sister, my brother and I sitting in the garden. My grandmother was a, a very keen uh, gardener. My grandfather was very good. He was, um, he, he kept bees. And he told us all about the, he was very excited about his bees and he made honey and told us about that. And he taught us how to, he taught us how to sing. Um, the fox went out one winter's night. Um, in this photo, we are singing that in the bath with my, <laughs> with my grandfather. Anyway, here are some more photos of my sister and brother at that time. Must have been taken by Uncle Michael, I think. They were six and five, and here, here they, here we all are sitting in my grandparents' garden. That summer, 1947, in England, it was terribly, terribly hot. I mean, it, it was unusually hot for England, I believe. This is outside my grandparents' bungalow at uh, Otford, with the lavender right nearby, and the three of us. Loved the smell of that lavender. My mother, grandmother made lavender bags. A whole side of England that suddenly I was introduced to. Um, and, and it uh, formed a very good impression on me because as soon as I could, when I was 18, I returned. This uh, photo of Michael Davis is a son of friends of my parents. And he apparently, I heard, used to tie me to the table leg when I was three, so I wouldn't interfere with his building blocks. 
he was his parents um, were very good friends of my parents and he later came and stayed with us in America when he was about 20 he went to college in America this is a photo of my grandmother as I remember her best my grandmother Tinny because my mother had me when she was only 20 I have a feeling they must have told me that my grandmother was actually my auntie and because I get things back to front frequently I think that I named her being the oldest grandchild I think I named her Tinny and after that that's what she was known as by everybody as we lived in New York and it was so horribly hot in the summer people were sleeping out on their uh, fire escapes they used to put their mattresses <laughs> out there uh, my mother made every attempt to get us away for the summer and it, went, it gave daddy a chance to do sculpture uh, wherever we rented something uh, and when I was 11 uh, what we rented was a little cottage on the shores of Lake Huron in Canada I met this little girl a girl that I was friends with called Becky and here she is and she and I used to go around together so daddy while he was there was in the cottage telling stories in the evening that he made up about a little a flying car and all the children of the neighborhood would would turn up as well to listen including uh, the Verity's children Julia and Sally who were on holiday next door um, and uh, he, I think it gave him an idea for writing his children's books because it started off with him children coming from near and far there were 15 at the end of the week he said <laughs> my father carved the King David uh, while we were up there it was his terra, mostly made of terracotta, but he found that by mixing the ha our hair in with the mixture, it made it stronger. So he'd cut bits off my mother, my sister and myself, which are now embedded in this sculpture. Uh, the uh, friend from next door, Ginny Norton, has now bought this and is very, very fond of it. That first summer in New York, when I was by now nine, uh, we joined up with the Verities, with Margaret and her children, my mother and all of us, and rented a cottage called Oak Bluffs on Martha's Vineyard. The, 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 both the husbands were working in New York over the summer uh, and would come out at weekends and visit us. This photo is one I very fond of. Mummy is talking to me about measuring me for clothes I think that she's making and this one is Julia, my brother and Sally and here my father is. He'd come obviously came down for the weekend and we're jumping off the pier and he's catching us. We used to go every day to the beach and uh, this is me with Sally I was always drawn immediately to the youngest child. I'm, here I am combing her hair and Christy sitting in the waves. We had a bit of a to do there too because Sally was only two years old and one day she just walked straight into the sea, straight in and she, the mothers were talking, Daddy noticed and he rushed after and picked her up and saved her. Now she'd have drowned, certain as anything. We spent wonderful summers from the age of when I was 12 to 16 escaping to uh, Charlemont, Massachusetts where my father knew uh, Alice Parker who was a conductor and pianist and the Parker family had this estate which, where they rented out houses. We stayed in one, here's the barn, first of all, Singing Brook Farm. And here's the ledges, which is the house which we stayed in. That's actually the kitchen and going down to the front door. This other view where it's, is the picture window looking out on the green mountains. There was a dammed up stream there so we could swim. It was really heavenly. This photo is of the lounge where Mummy used to lie on the couch and read Contiki 
and uh, Jane Austen, she read Pride and Prejudice, I remember as well, to my father while he was standing carving his panels, which I'll show you later. This is a view of the, as you approach the farm and come along the lane, that's the view in of the countryside and here's the view from from the porch of our house with the barn and the other house. This photo is my mother and sister near the pool and my sister. This is when people thought my sister might be a model. She was very pretty. And this photo, in this photo I'm sitting with Juno, Mrs. Parker's Alsatian that I looked after when she was ever away. She was a very busy person, she was wonderful. When we went to concerts, we sometimes went to Tanglewood in her car and she would be, um, so if someone else was driving, she'd be shelling peas on the, on the way. She had these five grown-up children and she obviously was one of these very early industrious kind of Americans who just can, can do everything, grew her own vegetables till she was 90 and things like that, absolutely amazing. Now, in this photo, my father is sitting on the porch making a little sculpture. He's got his hat that he often wore out there. He thought it brought him good luck. There's a photo of my brother. The um, ledges that we rented also had a log cabin in the just a few yards up the slope from the house, and my brother or any friends who came to stay would sleep up there. Here's a photo of the changing hut down near the pool. And there's Michael Davis, who you've met earlier. He um, came and stayed with us uh, when he was 20-odd. I was about 14 in this photo. And here's Michael Davis with Christy. And there's the pool and a diving board off the bridge. My brother and I, myself with air, air uh, plane inner tubes. The three of us in our swimsuits. We spend all day at, in the down near the pool. It seemed I seem to remember. Here's my mother. In this photo, she must be about thirty. She looks, you know, three growing up children, and she's still very young. No, she's a little bit older than thirty. She must be thirty-five. There's my father with pails. <laughs> and here he is again with some cows in the field. Here, in this photo, showing the view again from our porch. I'm 14 and had per permed my hair for the first time. I thought I was looking very glamorous, you see. Uh, here I am on a on the horse of a friend. And I'm about 16. Now then, this part is Alice Parker's log cabin because the Parkers had this large farm estate and they all had a log cabin each. That's the front porch. This is her music room. And I want to read a bit of... Um, Daddy's letter because it describes a wonderful episode that took place in Alice Parker's cottage log cabin. This was written in September 1950 and it's my father writing to Hugh. Since my last letter to you, a surprising and rather unforeseen event has taken place. Robert Shaw was up for a short visit to the Parkers, whose estate this is, to work on some arranging of songs with Alice Parker in preparation for a series of recordings he's making. And I asked him if he could sit, would like to sit for his portrait. I'd drop everything to do it. And he agreed. He took me up on it and came to, and stayed 10 days in Alice's cabin, where we worked with immense concentration, often from 10 a.m. till midnight, and on two occasions, all through till three o'clock the following morning, during which sessions Joan would sit encourage, make cups of tea for us, and Alice would play through the entire score of Bach's St. John's Passion, while Bob would stand or sit, 
singing the parts, commentating, modelling the music, which he will be also recording sometime this month. And I would be going crazy trying to catch that amazing, alive quality that took place in his face. Both Daddy and his brother Roderick were very interested in the story of Don Quixote and my father carved this panel of Don Quixote while he was in Massachusetts in the summer. This is one of the ones he was carving while my mother read to him in the evenings and I used to lie on the screened in porch and I could hear her voice. And this one called Spring Queen and King Corn, uh, which a friend of mine owns, owns uh, he carved that in 1955 in the summer. And here's, a, here's another one that he did in 1952 call, called Slumber, I think. Next door to us were their family called the Nortons, next door to us in New York at 177 East 94th Street. And uh, they very kindly invited all of us children to spend a month in the summer up in Canada where they had a house at Port Hope. And in this photo, the three of us are boarding the little plane to Toronto. And here we are playing canasta and we used to spend hours singing Sweet Violets. And here we are, the five of us, Ginny, myself, my sister, my brother and her younger brother Tommy all sitting at the side of their pool. And here I found a baby I could feed. This is um, Ginny's aunt's baby. I was in seventh heaven. When I was 17 that September my father got a job at the Norton Art Gallery uh, Art School in uh, West Palm Beach. So my father and mother uh, joined up about a year later and Daddy went ahead. When they went, moved down there, they were able to buy their first house and their first car. There's my sister with the fiddle concerto outside their house holding their cat. Here's my father represented in the uh, a cutting from the galleries. Oliver O'Connor Barrett, versatile artist, sculptor, composer, at work on the score of his opera, The Shushbird, to be presented at the Norton Gallery on May the 3rd. In the background, his wood sculpture, Abraham, and part of a cartoon for his largest relief panel, Crucifixion, Crucifixion of Man. Here's my father outside their house in Florida, starting to carve on a very large trunk of a tree. He starts it with an axe. He refines it from a, with a mallet and chisel. And here he is with another piece that we've already seen called The Exodus. When I was 18 in New York, I met the first the person I fell in love with first, who was called Lou Miller. Here he is. And I worked that summer as a waitress in Maine in, at Kennebunkport at the Old Fort Inn. There I am in my uniform. Unfortunately, we both had summer jobs, but not at the same hotel. Here's another photo of myself with him and that one. This is sitting on the beach at the uh, in Maine. Here's another one in Maine of, of me with uh, sitting on a cliff. When I worked as a waitress, I managed to slip some fried egg all the way down somebody's neck. It was hard work. We had to peel peaches for them, would you believe? But we had a great deal of fun. I, I learnt to drive and uh, we went out on a prom, uh, well, that's where we were driving. I 
went skinny dipping with the other waitresses, saw fireflies for the first time. And in, I liked Maine very much. Seems to me it's quite a lot like England in the countryside and the way it, just the way it was. I look forward to going back there one day. I had better sense than I realised because later we've kept in touch over the years and Lou now teaches English at Harvard University. So there was a whole... This, he's the one who represents the whole life, the American life I might have led. I worked to earn my fare to England and that September sailed to England on Queen Elizabeth I. And England in those days was very, very dreary. It, everything seemed grey, no colour. There were whole, in London there were parts of buildings left standing. You'd see just the rooms outlined on the end of buildings. I went to teacher's training college, which was such a shock after my lovely Dalton school, and trained to be a teacher for three years in the heart of Deptford. Well, when I stepped off the boat, arriving in England, my friend Michael Davis met me at the station. And uh, here I am in this photo uh, in front of Trafalgar Square, early after my arrival. All these relatives that I didn't know at this stage, really didn't know them. And um, here is Hugh, uh, my father's brother, with his wife, Deirdre, and their five children, Roger, Naomi, uh, Bella, the youngest one called Pussy, and Pup. Here's one of Roderick and his family. And this one, taken some time before, when my parents visited England, is with Alec and Doris, who we haven't seen. Uh, Alec and Doris with Lorna in Lorna's kitchen, Winifred, who's uh, Cecil's second wife, my father's stepmother. There's Joan and one of their Lorna's sons, I think. And here is my uncle Roderick, the painter. And I'm very fond of this portrait of him. There, it's now 2009 and I find myself with two grown-up sons, Ben, who's head of Mori, and Clement, who works in Berlin at the moment as an artist. Ben had Horace, who's now 13, and he's the light of my life. I think he'll go far. And Peter? I have two beautiful daughters, Nicola and Katie. And Katie is getting married in July and we're really looking forward to the wedding. I'm starting my history with my grandfather, um, a real Victorian grandfather he was too, and uh, he lived in Devon, and then as a young man he came up with about 50p in his pocket, somehow managed to exist and train as a surveyor. And then he gradually acquired property in Clapham, quite a number of properties. And um, I remember when I was a young boy, I used to come up once a year. And uh, at this time, my grandfather was in bed up at the big house from this muse here. And we'd have a talk. And then just before I left and was saying goodbye, he put his hand, and this was when he was in his 90s, put his hand under his pillow and pull out a five pound note. I always enjoyed those visits to my grandfather. 
My first photograph is of my father and his sister, my aunt Connie, when I think he, my father was about seven and she was five years old, when they lived in London and they lived in the large house at the end of this garden. Here are two photographs of my father in army uniform. The first one is, it shows on the back of this picture that he was at Chiseldon Camp and it was the 22nd of March 1918 and he was in the London Scottish Regiment. But then I come to another one I found and this one says uh, Redford, the 20th of May 1919 and appears to be an entirely different uniform. And my mother always used to tell me that he was in the Queen's Own Cameron Highlanders. So I assumed that he must have changed from the London Scottish to the Queen's Own Cameron Highlanders. This uh, photo is of my grandfather, my mother's father, um, showing the staff photo of the post office in Guernsey. Uh, he was he served the post office for 44 years. Here is my mother's father with his first wife and my mother, Ina, and her sister, Muriel. And the one, last one is of my mother and sister when I think they were probably about seven years old and five years old. The first picture is of my father with William Gardner known as G in the family. He was an auditor who um, came to audit my father's books and they became great friends. Uh, my father was the accountant uh, in charge of uh, the office in Jersey for Lord Vesty. And they both had a common, um, common background in the fact that my father and G were unable to divorce their wives because they refused to do so. Then we have G with my aunt Connie and they became very good friends. And the next picture shows my mother with my grandmother Routley and myself and my little brother John. And then we come to my father with Uncle Ian who married my mother's sister Muriel and my father has me on his lap and Uncle Ian has Michael on his lap. And then the last photo is of my mother with Muriel and my mother has John and I, and Muriel has Michael on her lap. This is a photo of Millie B. Avenue, who was my mother's greatest friend in Guernsey. And uh, they spent many, many happy times together and was a truly wonderful friend to my mother. And at the end of the war, on the 19th of May, 1945, she sent a letter specially to me saying, Dear Peter, I've just written a letter to your mummy and thought you would like to, a card all to yourself. I don't suppose you remember me, but I expect you have heard a lot about the people in the Channel Islands. We have had a lot of exciting times, which I hope to tell you about some day. Love from Auntie Millie. This is a picture of myself and my brother John uh, with a bowl. I'm not quite sure what doing with it. And a little while after that, my brother died of tubercular meningitis. Uh, this was in Morton Hampstead. And the following is a, is a card showing the interior of the Morton Hampstead church. And he was buried in the, at the back of the church there, his grave, which is rather sad. It's a very small little grave. And I have been to visit it several times since. This was the second death in the family. My father had died of TB in Jersey in um, May 1940. And shortly after that, my mother had to leave Jersey uh, as the Germans were going to occupy the island and left on one of the last ships 
before the Germans came. Uh, this next picture is of um, Jack Sprague and his wife, a farmer in Morton Hampstead and his wife and me um, behind two horses. Uh, we had a, several years on this farm and it was a very happy time away from all the bombs and um, I remember just one occasion really where I had a lovely time tobogganing in the snow in, in Devon. And uh, in this next one we have my cousin Michael and myself playing in the, in the hayfield. Obviously looking very happy, I've got a great grin on my face. The first is of my mother's father. He lived all the time right through the occupation in Jersey. And um, he, these three photos are one of some of the last photos that were taken because they had their, their cameras confiscated in 1943. And these were taken just before they weren't able to use them. If they were found with a camera, they would have been taken to a concentration camp no question about that. And uh, the lady with my mother's father here is his housekeeper who after, the, after he lost his second wife she became his housekeeper and was very good, very great companion to him during the rest of the war, very hard time. Um, near the end of the war there was virtually no food left at all and he was he was only um, virtually eating potatoes. He, he went down to, to be very thin by the end of the war. My mother's father came to live with us for the last 12 years of his life in Becks Hill. He was a very lively old boy. Um, and even in his 80s, he was trotting up to London every week. He also loved the cinema. He loved going to the local repertory company, a very good repertory company. He also taught me chess, but when I started beating him, he didn't want to play me anymore. This, this is a photo of uh, the school, the prep school that I was at from 1947 to 1950. Outside the Houses of Parliament, we were taken into the House of Commons and the House of Lords, and our dear headmaster, the Reverend Woodruff, came with us. He was a headmaster who loved beating people and we, he had a penalty system in the school where if you had three bad marks you were up before him and he had a lovely selection of canes, plimsolls and after he'd beaten you he'd apologise. Delightful men. February 1956 I was called up for my national service in the Royal Air Force and this photograph is of my little group of uh, very um, novice airmen um, being fitted out for our uniforms at Cardington. We stayed there for one week and then we went on to West Kirby in Liverpool where we didn't know what hit us with these drill instructors terrifying us and it was at West Kirby that I after two weeks went down with flu tried to carry on because I didn't want to have to start my square bashing again. Um, we were um, in uh, the, uh, we had to do a parade for an air vice marshal who inconveniently died. So we were having this parade in a raging snowstorm. We had uh, billets where there were coke fires and uh, we were doing gym on concrete, cold concrete floors. And so I'd had a heavy cold at, Card at um, Cardington and I think that was the start of why I had this flu. Anyway, I tried to keep going with the flu, couldn't keep going, had to report sick. I was then in an RAF hospital with very, very nice, attractive nurses in lovely uniforms and I was there for six weeks and I had severe bronchitis, part of my lung collapsed and then they decided that I was fit for civilian life but unfit for service life. So they were going to med medically discharge me. I came back to Becks Hill for about two weeks sick leave. Then I went back in May where they discharged me. So my 
long service was from February to May 1956. And this other picture was of when I was on sick leave, my cousin Michael, who he served in the Navy for 12 years, more than 12 years, I think, and he came to visit me. I'm looking very ill and pale in this picture of my uniform, and he's in his naval uniform, standing at attention in Edgerton Park in Bexhill. After I was medically discharged from the RAF, I came back to live with my mother in Bexhill, and uh, feeling very sorry for myself, I couldn't get a job. I was having to go on dole queue every week and I was moping around the house looking very depressed and my mother just got exasperated one day and just said, for goodness sake, Peter, go out and join something. So I took her at her word and I went and joined the local tennis club and the local rifle club. And I'm very grateful to her for that because I have many years' enjoyment in those clubs. I, um, I did rather well in both the tennis and the shooting. I was um, singles champion and doubles champion several years in the tennis club. And I was the top shot in the rifle club for, for many years. And I have a, a target here showing one of the 100 out of 100 that I got, the possible I got. In the same year that my father died of TB, my brother died of tubercular meningitis. Her sister Muriel was in her house in West Wickham uh, in the war and um, she was working in the kitchen and this bomber came along. Um, I'd, I'd been told by my mother that um, my cousin Michael um, was playing next door with some other children and that's why he wasn't killed. But in fact, I have a newspaper article here where it mentions that Michael was looking for acorns in the road and a neighbour heard this plane coming and grabbed hold of him and took him into her house. Unfortunately, this bomber, he was trying to uh, lighten the plane and got rid of his bomb and demolished this house in West Wickham and Muriel was the only person killed in West Wickham that day. And the other photo is an uh, experience that I had directly when I was living in Purley. We saw this Dakota coming straight towards the house and um, it was obviously in trouble. The engine noise sounded very unhealthy. There was red lights flashing, coming straight towards our house. And at the last minute, he banked and crashed into a house just down the road from us. And unfortunately, three Canadians were, were killed in that plane. But nobody was killed in the house. It just missed the house, it landed in the garden. And nobody was in that house at the time. So. Um, I also remember um, running to the window one day to uh, when a, a flying bomb was coming over and um, my mother shouting at me, come away from the window, Peter. And uh, But I was very excited seeing this bomb going along with the flame going out of the back of it. And on another occasion, uh, the, um, one of the flying bombs uh, blew up in, in Purley and the blast was so great that it took out the dining room windows and curtains just in one fell swoop. This was a newspaper article in the local paper in London. March the 3rd, 1976, it's a picture and the title of it is Bomber's Lair in SW4. I was living on the second floor in number 44 north side with my second wife and my first daughter Nicola was just a few months old when one weekend my mother was staying with us and um, suddenly there's all this commotion, police arriving, sniffer dogs arriving, plastic bags being taken out of the building. Uh, this 
This place next door to 44, number 43, North Side, was owned by a southern Irishman who had 33 bed sits in there. And he thought they were all southern Irishmen that he had in there, but unfortunately one of them was a northern Irishman. And he had 40 pounds of explosives in his room, which was right close to my daughter's bedroom. So that was quite exciting. <laughs> I inherited the large house at the end of this garden in 1975 from my aunt when she died and I decided that it would be good if we divided the, heart, the garden in half so I put a fence halfway down the garden so that whoever lived in this muse house would have a really nice garden.